In 2020, the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum took delivery of this Model A Panther. It was restored over several long years by Access Track Services, an organisation headed by the redoubtable Bruce Crompton, who is famous for his Discovery Channel show, Combat Dealers. Also featured in this program are the men behind the restoration work, Nick and Phil, aka the twins, who meticulously reconstructed this iconic vehicle. While they were down under visiting us for Oz Armor Fest, they shared with me some of the little known details about this incredible restoration story. This Panther was found in south of England. It came over with a, a deal for other tanks from Sabur because it was on a, a range in France for a while. So there was a lot of uh, modern shells stuck in it all over it. <laughs> it was a wreck. Basically, I think it was on the range and because of all explosions, all the dirt come over and gone inside. Years of corrosion and uh, say that the, where it had been on the range, there was shells had passed through it and hit all everything inside. The only wartime damage we know of is a six pounder through the front here. It had gone through and broke the track, jammed the drive unit and the track had come off because it weighs about five tonnes and had gone up and smashed the overtrack plate and took the fuel tank and everything else out. First thing we did while it was outside, we had the turret off, the tracks came away. The next job was we built a complete carriage fit underneath it on casters. We had the wheels off and then it was a case just pulling it into the workshop. The first thing, never look at the big picture because you just scare yourself silly. It's not even worth trying that, especially on a large project like this. So what we tend to do is strip it all down as much as we can get. The idea is to get the, the hull of the tank to a point where there's just nothing hanging on it. Then we approach every part of what we've taken off, usually large chunks, and then work on each one of those separately. Heat things red hot, soak them with water, cool them right down, and then what happens, it shocks it. And then you can usually undo with your fingers. The final drives on the Panthers were a problem. Uh, during the war, they were a weakness of the, the Panther tank. The way they were constructed and also the materials they were using. There was an, an issue with the way that the gears were made inside. Too many sharp edges, transition from the shaft to the actual gear, they snap. Well, because um, anything to do with a, a tank running on dry pin like this, uh, it's wear. Basically, they're sacrificial, so things like the, the sprockets were, were worn. We checked them against the sort of drawings and things like that. So we had new sprockets made. We had all new gears made using very high quality materials and we made a few tweaks to the manufacturing techniques. They got over the problem of breakages. These should, should outlive the tank easily. We found a certain amount of sabotage. Someone had actually drilled a hole in the fill and tube inside so that it would have had only a very small amount of oil put in it, thinking it was full up because it poured over the top and come out the bottom. That could quite easily have made the thing fail, usually after it's been tested at the factory in which case it saves the person at the factory from ever being found out. We've got new torsion bars on this. They were quite badly damaged where it had been laying for, for years. The whole lot had collapsed and to be honest, 80 year old torsion bars aren't worth using. All the actual um, swing arms for the suspension were in fairly good condition. We had a few issues with the hubs. Uh, one of them was quite badly damaged. We managed to repair that. On a normal wheel hub, you have a sleeve inside to keep the bearings apart. Um, the bearings came in from either side and what they did, because of the size of them, they actually used wood in pieces that all fitted together and that was designed to absorb a certain amount of space inside the hub so that they didn't use to put so much grease in them. The one particular hub that we had a problem with, it meant remaking the, the new wood for that one. This wheel is the same as the one behind it, just turned around. I think we needed an extra couple of these to make up the full set. So what we did, we just machined off the bit that normally runs on the horns. It was quite a simple thing to do, but um, it gave us an extra couple of wheels, which we didn't have. We didn't find out until quite late on the rear idler or the rear adjuster shafts. They weighed probably about a quarter of a tonne each, and it was bent by 20 mil. And we didn't realise until we come to put it on, and we put it all back in, put the wheel on, and it was, it was towing in quite badly. There's a particular swing arm on each corner and they are specific to that corner and they have a, a mount for a shock absorber. And in each wheel station uh, there's a, a bump stop. And they're made of what we call Bellevue washers, which are just cupped washers that all fit together. 
uh, not rubber or anything like that. Tracks on, on, on these dry pin setups are, are sacrificial. They don't last. They're 80 years old. They've had a good life. So it's easier to use new. Uh, we had the metal analyzed to see what they actually made of. And they were a bit of a witch's brew, to be honest. They could never match them. So we had them made. Uh, and they used a, a modern equivalent to what they normally use on earth moving machines. These are probably stronger than the originals were. We were lucky enough to have a brand new unused link, which was probably one that originated from the side here and never got used. Uh, they 3D scan it, then they crease it by 5 to 10 percent to allow for shrinkage. So it was quite a, a complicated calculation because the pin holes were actually uh, moulded with it, so they would have cores inside. And so far it's been really good. The gearbox of these are built in sections, so you end up with probably about four layers. So you can't just swap a layer out for another one. It has to be either repaired or a new gearbox housing because they're put together in layers, then line board through, so it all lines up. We found quite a lot of damage where the shell had come through this side had gone into the side of the gearbox here, which basically is third and fourth gear. Uh, it hit the brake, the tiller, the gear lever, straight into the side and wrecked the inside of the gearbox. We just stripped the whole gearbox and differential down. All the parts went off to a company to have them degreased and cleaned. When we got them back, they found out yeah, there was quite a few gears damaged, a couple of the shafts, the synchro for fourth and third. We had them remade. The clutch was completely rebuilt, new bearings throughout. The only biggest problem was the casing was damaged. There's probably about a 50 mil hole inside of it. We found a company who could repair the gearbox. They uh, cut out a section that was damaged on that layer and completely machined up a new section. And they laser welded it back in again, which is pretty fantastic. We wasn't totally confident with the casting and Taking that sort of damage, it may have done a little spider type cobweb crack somewhere. We used a two pack material, which is quite thick, and painted it a couple of coats of that inside the whole casing, just in case there's any small cracks, because the last thing you want is an oil leak. When we built the gearbox, we filled it up with oil and gave it a turnover every day for about a week or so. And there was one small leak, I think, on one of the pipes. But apart from that, it was pretty good. The gearbox is lowered through here by getting hold of the tail shaft. So it comes in on its end and goes along and just sits at the front here. Ended up just putting a strop right around the back tail shaft and dropping it in that way. Once the gearbox is in, then putting all the steering gear in over the top of it, which is basically the shaft that runs the whole width of the vehicle which is all articulated, but it's all needle roller bearings. And if it comes apart, you just get showered in needle well bearings. It was a bit of a juggle and it's not light. That's one part of the steering assembly which was missing is these valves. This is the valve that operates the steering. We're quite in with Bobbington Tank Museum. They loaned us one and we had it copied and recast and remade all the interior parts of it. They're very fine settings inside it. You've got big brakes on the side here which are ducted under the floor. There's a square box section that runs right under the middle of the tank, right to the back. Then has pipes on it which pull up and go into the fans, which draws all the mess and the dust and that from these brake side brakes. This is the driver's visor. You've got a handle here which you can pull, which closes it. That seals the whole tank in. Got a huge spring on it, so it assists you to open it because of the weight of the actual visor itself on the outside. If they get a problem with these lenses it just opens like that that bit folds down you pull the lens out clean it or whatever replace it if it needs it it's a piece of glass that thick fold that up and away you go we had this part of it the frame but it was a bit damaged so we repaired that um, we had some drawings we remade the whole frame here and then we had parts of the linkage on it, just generally reverse engineered the whole thing. This is the dashboard. We put electric gauges in. The mechanical ones are okay, but we wouldn't use old gauges because of the danger of them not working. We've got a fire suppression system in this. Uh, they did have, a, did have a fire extinguisher system, which was a, a clockwork device, which had sensors all around the engine. 
This device is a modern one. If there is a fire at any point around the engine or the fuel system or the electrical system, the flames would burn through this pipe and the pipe is charged with nitrogen. The extinguisher material come out of that point there and only put the fire out where the fire is. The engine bay had nothing in it. There was no radiators, no fans, no rear compartment for the water and the uh, fuel tanks. You've got a header tank just there, which holds about 60 litres. You have two other tanks either side, one at the top, one at the lower down. Overall, it holds about 730 litres of fuel. They're all remade in stainless steel. The radiators we completely built from scratch and then had new cores fitted to them. Fan drive housings we completely built from scratch. All the deck at the top here is all original. The only thing you find with the German stuff is that a lot of time things aren't interchangeable from different vehicles. So we found when we put the deck in the middle of this is obviously not the original one. These holes, the bolts never lined up. If you wanted to get this off to do anything to it, that's a lot to undo. These bolts here is the only ones that hold the deck down. So it'll be really quick to get the deck off. The engine that came with this vehicle was sent away to the boys at Army Tech in the Czech Republic. They stripped down the entire block and painstakingly rebuilt the entire unit. If you've been lucky enough to hear this tank start up and run in person, then I don't need to tell you what a magnificent job they did. Drop the engine in, we, we had a, a crane company come in and we just lowered it straight in. It goes straight down, there's about 20 mil each side. It bolts around the front and two bolts at the back and that's basically it. This fan is connected to them pipes. And as it draws the air in, around the exhaust, up the pipe and into the fan, draws it away. So it does cool this side a bit better than that one, but this side gets really hot. This was um, Brian and Alan Rutter did, did, did work on this. They'd done one before, so they were kind of fairly a favour how it all works. The basket was in a, a, a bit of a mess. It was, it'd been out in the open and it rusted away, basically. It, was, it wasn't worth saving. Well, the gun itself is as it came. We, we've obviously restored it all and tidied it all up. The main mount for it, the parts inside that you don't see from the outside. Uh, we didn't have that. We were lucky to actually manage to get one of those. Well, there was a muzzle brake on it, but it wasn't the correct one. What happened was it just hauled to a show as, as a static and uh, somebody actually managed to get it off. This one came from somewhere else. We managed to find another one. The gun really, really hadn't done a lot to it as, as is. Um, it was in pretty good shape. This is all original. Uh, I don't think there's a hell of a lot wrong with it. We replaced the lower shaft through here and a new pin through it but basically it was uh, pretty intact. When we got the tank, there was no mount for the gun. It was just pushed in there and a load of angle iron and steel welded to it, hold it still. So they relied a lot on that. The gearbox, which is down this side, the one that does the traverse, is set up at the moment uh, to do it manually. Normally they're connected by a shaft from here down to there, to this central gearbox operated by the person sitting in the seat just there. They've got foot pedals at the bottom there and they could traverse the, the gun with their feet. And that was powered by this gearbox. We haven't connected it because we haven't got everything to connect it to and that would be a, a bit of a dodgy thing to do. There is another box that fits here, which is a, the one that operates the, the actual um, elevation of the gun. We hadn't got any of that and also there's a ram that fits down there which is um, all cable operated and that assists the gun up and down because yeah. of the, the weight of it. There's locking device here which I'm leaning on. That, that locks the turret. Just release that and it allows the turret to move. And this is for fine adjustment. Because you can't actually get to the suspension once all this locks in, there was no way of keeping it greased. So this is how they got over the problem. These are the greasing system or the central lubrication system for the whole tank. There's two here, two on the other side, and they are plumbed in with eight mil pipe. Semi-liquid grease was pumped into them and that would feed every single station around inside the tank, including all the idlers at the back. There's a hundred meters of eighth pipe draped all underneath here. We were lucky enough to have the actual lid uh, for this, this rear hatch but somebody had actually just sliced this through here with a torch. We had no reference for this at all. We knew roughly what the shape was from pictures, but how it actually closes. Quite a clever thing. It just swings in and then it latches closed. You just sort of jiggle it around till it 
all lines up. A total nightmare to, to reverse engineer. Yeah. <laughs> it had a bit of damage on it, it wasn't that bad. They made such a good job of it, I can't see where it is. <laughs> is it around here? Down below. Down below in that bit, yeah. Because that is the um, handle to actually lower and raise the uh, lid. And we had it all working, yeah. And that, that twists and then winds down. At first glance, they look fairly straightforward, but like everything German, they're not. Normally these would be pressed. So, but we have to hand make them. If you make them in sections, but, uh, and they've folded in on the underneath here just for strength. Because of the thickness, it's not, not like normal car body thickness of material. This two mil, which is quite heavy going. What often used to happen is because they're fairly vulnerable, they used to take them this lower section off, turn it round, clips into there and bolts back down again. And that left access to the front tracks and everything else for changing tracks. But also with them off, you can lift these, which gives you access to the towing eyes at the front. This is our version of Zimmerit. It's the MAN pattern. We found a sample of it on the side, so we knew the shape of it and everything else, dimensions. We used a roller effect to get the, the stippling here, but it's at the actual material. We used a floor tile adhesive mixed with sawdust. Uh, and it duplicated it really absolutely perfectly. And it does work, we've tried it. It what? is anti-magnetic. Is it actually? Yeah, it will, it will stop uh, a magnetic mine from sticking to it. Because of its location and the fact that all this is welded in and it was gonna come out, uh, but the ball itself had completely seized in there. It was absolutely solid. We put a lot of heat into it to try and get it out. And in the end, um, it, did, it did come out eventually, which was quite a relief but it's a very heavy item. The biggest problem was actually putting it back in again. It's a bit like a, a, a Chinese puzzle. It's, there has to be a particular way you, you, you sort of maneuver it to get it in there. In the end, we thought, ah, there's gotta be an easier way to do this. We had, we had three of us on it trying to do it. And in the end, we, uh, we, uh, we kind of cheated a bit. We, we cut the flange off the back, got it in there, then welded the flange back on again. Yeah. So it works. Moving to the back here, yeah, we've got this no tech light. The bracket itself is original. We managed to salvage that, which was quite nice, but these suffer. They know, I mean, you very rarely find an intact one of these. What it is, it's a green uh, lens mounted inside as a bulb, but the lens itself is divided into four sections blacked out around the outside. So all you see is four sections when it's lit up. It was used for Abstand, which is basically the distance between each vehicle in a convoy. When you're too close to it, you can see all the four sections. When you get to around about the, the average decent distance behind it, the lights merge into two. The jack is 20 tonne. You need about four people to get it up there. And, <laughs> and you can do it on your own to get it down. Yeah. <laughs> Just walk away. <laughs> the inertia starter is in this one. You drop that away, put the handle in, wind it up, get it buzzing, pull the lever and away it goes. It's a sort of something from a throwback from when they, they used it on aircraft to save having to have batteries on the aircraft. They used an inertia starter, so they wind it up. Similar to a child, children's car where they, you rub it like this and they let it go. It all fits in with gears into a, a unit about the size of a starter motor. And it can be wound up. You wind and wind and wind, get the thing buzzing pull a lever and it starts the engine. Track adjusters in here and here. This one is the heater, the preheater for the engine. They had a system where in very cold weather they could put a blow lamp into there, which does a heat transfer into the water system so it stops the engine freezing up. So these boxes, well, we made them. They are just storage bins, basically. Very rarely survive anyway, and they would get knocked off quite readily. If they haven't rusted away, they're just beaten for pieces. Although it had mounts on it, which was done by the previous owner, um, they'd obviously never tried to put the tools in it because none of them fitted. They looked the part, but so we had to remake it. We used some elements of it, but maybe we started again on all that. Lot. We start here, we've got a track adjuster. This goes in through the back. The obligatory uh, sledgehammer. Wooden block here is mainly to support the jack, which is mounted in the middle at the back, stop it sinking into the ground when they jack the wheels. This cable is specifically for dragging the tracks on and off. 
fire extinguisher, which seems a bit of a crazy place to put it, but that's where they put it. This is for the inertia starter. Tow cables, it carries two, one either side. A bit of a tricky situation because with the regulations on cables and making up cables, uh, there is a set way of doing them. To get them look authentic, which was to have these ferrules made for the ends, what we had to do is machine those up, slide them out the way, get the guys when they actually made the cables for us. They slid them over, pulled the whole thing together with the eyes on the end, crimped them on, and then we slid them over and glued them in place. So they look the part. Yeah. And they probably would be okay. Yeah. General purpose wire cutters, insulated, are actually made of compressed paper with the resin mixed with it hooks are used for connecting it to the to the towing vehicle. If they needed extra length, they could hook two cables together. Standard German army spade, axe, um, always straight handles on German axes, never a curly one like the Americans use. What crowbar for when changing the tracks, always useful. This tube is for storage of the three spare antenna and all the gun cleaning rods and tubes and brushes will go in here. We filmed this the day the lads flew back home to the UK and it was impossible to fit all the things we wanted to cover into this one video. But we would love to dive deeper into the Oz Armour Panther and its restoration. So leave your suggestions and questions in the comments for next year's Panther video and we'll make sure we get it covered. That's all we have time for today. A huge thank you to Nick and Phil for sharing their stories and helping out at Oz Armour Fest this year. Be sure to join us next Wednesday for your weekly tank restoration fix. So until then, I'm Kurt from Oz Armour, and I'll see you on the next one.